Hello and welcome to EGX 2018. This is the second of our developer sessions today. Are you all having a good time at EGX? Way, brilliant, wonderful. Uh, my name is Matthew Castle. I'm from Rock Paper Shotgun, and I'm incredibly excited to be introducing the panel for Disco Elysium. Uh, I played this game back in Resd earlier in the year, and it just absolutely blew my mind. It's one of the craziest demos you're going to see. I'm sure they're going to tell us loads of exciting stuff. Uh, I'm about to welcome Alex, Robert, and Argo to the stage, but before they come up, uh, we're just going to watch this. You are a detective in the city of Rivershaw. Solve a massive, open-ended case. Get lost exploring the city in this groundbreaking RPG. Hi, um, thanks for coming today. Um, I'm Alex Wiltshire. Um, I'm here with uh, Robert and... Um, Argo. <laughs> um, from uh, Cedo Zaum, who are making Disco Elysium, uh, which is honestly like the most exciting RPG I've played, because I played a demo a few months ago, for um, maybe ever, definitely since um, Planescape. Tall men, and um, no so it's pressure. really <laughs> so it's really good to be able to talk to them about some of the ideas behind them. Um, to explain what it's about, uh, you play as the cop that you saw there, um, and there are loads and loads of exciting ideas that kind of that, that form your adventure within this kind of weird kind of semi 1970s kind of alternative kind of um, uh, eastern western city. Um, uh, and one of them is the fact that you get to talk to your own psyche, like. In most RPGs, your uh, skills are things like vitality and agility and strength and stuff. In this, your skills are things like electrochemistry, which is your ability to deal with drugs uh, and deal with the fact that they want you to have drugs. So early in the game, I, it made me take a quest to find a packet of cigarettes, uh, and that was one of the better quests I've played in my life. Um, uh, you can choose the kind of detective you want to be as well. Like you can be a hyper-rationalist kind of uh, procedural cop. You can be hard-bitten, punchy cop. You can be all kinds of cops, and it's up to you. Uh, and one of the things I'm really excited about is like, where on earth this came from? Uh, and one of the answers I figured was that it came from pen and paper RPGs because like it really feels like playing a pen and paper RPG with wonderful pictures and amazing writing. Is that true? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm somewhat of a, of a, of a pen and paper, paper evangelist. Uh, so I've been playing pen and paper since I was 15, 16, and then I started pouring into it my ambitions as a novelist and, and um, but, uh, playing it with um, my uh, young artist friends back then. So we went really highbrow with it. And then uh, in my personal experience, uh, I think it's as good as storytelling and culture gets, as deep and as involving uh, to create it with people there. But the problem is, of course, that you can't in any way monetize it, you can't live on it, you can't record it, you can't take it anywhere. I, I, I shudder to think of all the hundreds of really, really good pen and paper games that are just evaporating. Um, so, yeah, naturally we started building our own world and then and, and sort of <laughs> ended up dedicating a large part of our lives to try to encapture this as a video game, maybe, or the first question, of course, is how to get it to people. So it, it really has, it has roots in that, um, 
very story-centric pen and paper game type uh, that, in my experience, hasn't been attempted um, as a video game before. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that you um, wrote novels before that. Like, is that where this particular world and story came from? Yeah, the, the novel was a kind of um, road test number one for the world, uh, which sort of turned out to be my life's work in a way. I didn't see that happening when I was 16 and started playing Dungeons <laughs> and Dragons. Uh, so that was sort of, uh, that was our kind of trial by fire. Does it work? You know, does it create actually good fiction? Does it create new situations? Does it solve things for uh, IPs? Um, like one of the things I got really excited about was telephones. You need to have telephones in a story. You need to have a world that has telephones. Otherwise, you get into Game of Thrones problems, like people sending ravens for four months and destroying spatial logics. <laughs> but at the same time, does it, um, can you say something about childhood in it? Can you say something about communism in it? Uh, can you say something about the 21st century in it? Can you talk about things uh, straight on, but at the same time in a, in a, in a science fiction fantasy la language of world building? So, uh, <laughs> hasn't, you'll have to take me by my word, uh, hasn't been translated to English yet, uh, but it landed us, uh, it turns out, uh, funding for a video game, and uh, quite a large video game too. Well, so yeah, because it started out as a smaller kind of project called No Truce for the Furies, wasn't it? Like, how, how did you, <laughs> was it a matter of the scale just exploding, or, or, or did you have something bigger in mind at the start and kind of have to start small? Uh, the kind of level of um, detail or, or, or um, realism that we're going for uh, tends to, it turns out, um, sort of explode things. Uh, so yeah, we thought it was gonna be, we had a much bigger game planned before this one even, and we thought it was going to be a first road test of getting to share what we've been building us f for the last, for most of our adult lives uh, with the Western world, so to say. Uh, and then uh, as we got further down development, the beginning of the game really started jiving with people. Uh, I really felt we have a hook, a once in a lifetime story hook that's not easy to come up with story hooks to start a role playing game. And I kind of understood that this is our eight mile moment now, you know, mom spaghetti and everything. Um, so, yeah, um, we need to put our big boy hat on, name it something commercial, something that, you know, people don't uh, associate with furries, uh, and then take a swing at, uh, you know, cracking America with it. And we've gotten to England. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, can you tell me about sort of what it takes to... So, so one of the things about this game is that... Um, in any situation, uh, the things that your character does and says, the kinds of things that the, the character notices about the environment, uh, the things that other characters say to you are totally prescribed by the skills that you have, these elements of the character's psyche. Um, uh, you can go into situations and get completely different experiences depending on the character that you've um, brought into it. Can you talk about maybe one of the early scenes, like um, maybe the, like I was thinking there's a moment where you've got to cut down a cadaver that's been hanging from a tree mm -hmm. for a few weeks or months and you've got to figure out kind of, it's what you're here to investigate. Can you tell me how that scene came together? Like sort of how many words went into this kind of scene that maybe took, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes to play? Oh, the cadaver. Uh, oh, that was nasty. <laughs> yeah, that was nasty stuff. Yeah, I researched it and wrote it for about five months. The entire company was thinking we're not going to get it released ever. Because <laughs> Robert's writing what we call the dead body. Yeah, and it sort of became, <laughs> became very symbolic. Uh, it takes, yeah, about 30 minutes if you're very precise with it. I wanted there to be the most gruesomely detailed autopsy scene. <laughs> it's really foul. <laughs> in games. And then your skills intercept and tell you things about it. So. Uh, oh, God, I wanted weird things going on there. Usually in games or in media, you have a beautiful young woman, and then they die, and then, you know, <laughs> men go and sort of ogle at the girl in plastic and so on. Uh, I decided I want, a, I, want a, I want an old, I want a middle-aged man who looks like the main character, 
uh, and then I got to spend time with that for four months. It was gruesome, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A uh, lot of an insanely amount, an insane amount of work go, goes into making these branching dialogues and making them work. Uh, the, the skill system, I think, is the talking skills, so to say. It's been a. I really hope other people steal it from us. If there are any developers here, please make your skills characters who talk to you. It, I think it's it's a step that you have to have there uh, to make this kind of uh, story-based games very personal to the player. It's a, it's a kind of developmental tool that you, it's gonna be a, it needs to be a stepping stone there because it gives you a feeling that you are involved in this ball of text. It's, it's your skill talking to you. You gave that skill voice. So it, the, the story wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible without them. Yeah, I enjoyed also the fact that the skills will kind of push back against you as well. Like you've, if you put points into a skill, it might not be awfully good. Like, um, there's a skill called, um, is it compulsion? The one uh, where you can compel other people to do things for Suggestion. you. Suggestion. Suggestion. Uh, on one hand, it means you can kind of, you can convince people to do what you want. But on the other hand, if you lose face in front of somebody, it gets upset and might make you do things you, you maybe as a player you don't want. How did you kind of make sure that you don't, as a player, feel frustrated by being railroaded? Do you, do you feel frustrated by, uh, by thinking? <laughs> uh, I think you do. I think, look, I think what, we, what we discovered is for a really detective game, you need to simulate thinking in a way. And games have been not very good at simulating thinking. It's been sort of boring, um, abstract in a way. Uh, but at the same time, the struggle of thinking every day, like right now, composing sentences, hearing you know, little fears popping up in the background or like, uh, you know, my conceptualization giving me a bad joke, which I'm not going to take, and so on. Uh, there's a kind of anxiety and tension to being alive and thinking. Uh, and then we, we wanted that to be there. And then turns out you can sort of do it by role-playing game systems, by Dungeons and Dragons systems. So I think, first of all, it's a, it's a thinking simulator in a way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned like before... Just, just, oh. Like, just in, in, like in real life, uh, your skills aren't always your friends. Like uh, when, when uh, uh, in real life you feel this uh, irresistible urge to go for a, c a cigarette, like this is a thought inside, inside your head, but it's not always a great idea. So this is kind of what happens with, with our skills. Sometimes they give you bad advice you shouldn't act on. I don't know why people like it. If they like it, they seem to have some kind of connection to the skills talking. We didn't need to tutorialize any of it. Everyone just said, yeah, yep, I have. I have that. <laughs> Most people say, yeah, it's sort of the situation I'm in generally, in the, the hate person. I mean, it's a result of your choices, though. Like, you, you know, if you've chosen to have a very strong electrochemistry kind of uh, uh, skill, yeah, it's you're, you're going to need a drink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, yeah that's the, that brings it back to the, it, it's sort of being you. It, it's very easy to, the, the trick we do, the big trick, is to have the skills have portraits which are like human faces. By seeing a human face talk to you, uh, but they're really abstract, weird, like logic has like, you know, arrows coming out of it. But by seeing just eyes and mouths, it just feels like it's something inside me, some kind of ghost in me that's talking. And you're interested always, you know, in what uh, eyes and mouths have to tell you, not so much in arrows and, and, and portal logos, sorry. <laughs> um, I was interested in what you said earlier on about having telephones in this, in this world. Um, like, there's a, there are cars, there are telephones, there are hotels, there are lots of things that we all recognize, but it's very much a fantasy world. Like, why, what interests you in having kind of that kind of realistic sort of uh, layer in, in this world? I think our, our like, um, our, our token of doom in this life is that uh, we sort of, we started out as a cultural movement. Um, so, I don't know if you know what a cultural movement is. Uh, they were very popular in the early 20th century. I'm going to sound really pretentious by saying that Tadaists were a cultural movement. Uh, I'm not saying we were Tadaists. Uh, yes, we're, we're not. We're not. We were a really uh, quite unsuccessful, I like to say fantastically unsuccessful <laughs> cultural movement uh, in a small Eastern European country. We were mostly very left-wing people, uh, not very popular in nowadays Eastern Europe. Uh, got into mm, political scandals, bad things that happen to you if you start a cultural movement. 
but we were able to kind of compose a group of people who all have mad ambitions for culture, for, for painting, you know, um, for even music and poetry, uh, who don't generally uh, work well in a, in, a, in a software development company. Uh, but I knew, like, and we knew immediately that if we want to put this together, it can't be cyberpunk. It can't be high fantasy. It can't be dark, dark fantasy. I'm never going to get these people inspired enough to work and give their lives away for five years or four years, as we've been doing this, if it, if it doesn't have real human relations, if it doesn't reflect on the world we're in. Um, so, yeah, that sort of that created the very real need to have, a, have an IP, I guess, or a setting uh, that accommodates for that, um, that these pretentious people aren't uh, uh, embarrassed to say they're doing, <laughs> sort of, in a way. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, the, we, I mean, the dirty secret is we started with a real, like, kind of high fantasy world when we were 16. It was bronze punk or something. Yeah, with and elves and dwarves and swords and magic and all that, <laughs> <laughs> layer by layer, but sort of chipping it away. And we just sort of started dis discovering that this doesn't feel right in a story. You can't say it so that it's, it sounds cool and believable. You can't say city names when it's like Elrinden. It's sort of wink, wink, yeah. so we needed to get real geop geopolitical entities in there and so on. So it completely spiraled out of control, uh, swallowed my entire life. Uh, oh, I mine too. <laughs> mine too and a lot of our other people. Uh, and then uh, here we are, like, um, you know, showing a really small piece of it, like a hotel cafeteria on a seaside somewhere. And then uh, I, I, I understand that it probably feels for English people and Western people that we kind of ma materialized out of thin air with this uh, insanity that we've <laughs> <laughs> showed you. What's some, um, like, you mentioned that, you know, if you were going to convince a group of artists and, you know, sort of people outside the games to make a game, you had to sort of situate in the real world. Like, on that basis, why, why haven't games been more involved in cultural movements before now. Like, since games have been made for, you know, 30, 40 years, uh, why don't you see more of this kind of group of creatives coming together? Yeah, there's, there's one other um, precedent of it, which is um, I always forget people's names when I'm on stages. Uh, yeah, me too. Uh, I speak Lodge. <laughs> Uh, oh, right. Yeah, um, a Russian um, group of also friends and artists who made a, a very uh, cool video game studio, uh, but not a lot of other presidents. Why is it? Um, I think we're just entering the, to the era, era where this is happening. Like we're literally just, uh, just the door, door has just opened and we just entered it. I think it's going to happen a lot more in the future, in the very near future. I, I I one of the reasons is... Um, it, because there's a bit of demand for it. We live in capitalism. There has to be a certain kind of demand for it. And then I see this hall isn't completely empty at all. I, I see. I mean, it, it's, it, it must be a mirage, but I see people in here. So I'm, I'm, you know, in awe of it. Um, uh, so I guess, I guess you <laughs> are one of the reasons uh, why we're getting to see um, this happening. Why we haven't seen it before? Uh, honestly, because games are a bit shit. Uh, <laughs> um, it, you know, they're very cool. I've been a gamer my whole life. I was a gamer when it was, you know, not a dirty word and a very cool word to be a gamer and a very unifying word and so on. Um, I've had some of the happiest times in my life in Absolutely. dungeons, <laughs> uh, killing things. I think uh, I, uh, the happiest in my entire life I was in the Icewind Dale one dungeons. Yeah. What was yeah, it called? Exactly. The, the, Weeping Stone Dungeon? Sultan Sultan Sultanesellar, yeah, yeah. I just felt happy there. So, you know, you, you come to your uh, early, your know, late 20s, early 30s, and then you look back at your childhood and you think, what did I really like in life? And do I, did I really like being a novelist, which is a sad, old thing to do, stuffy, uh, literature is a pretentious, uh, snobbist, classist world, or, or, or did I like, you know, playing this really unbelievably promising new way of communicating? Or I don't know, I never even thought what they are, games. Uh, and it, yeah, we kind of returned to it and thought, you know, let's make a last dash at communicating something to the world. 
in a game. And I think a lot of other people are going to start yeah. doing it too. It's the audience is here, and it's not elsewhere. Films are going down, books are, believe me, it's not a good hustle. Um, I, think, I think the tide of history is on the side of games now. Yeah, yeah. Can I, um, can I ask you a really pretentious question? Uh, a sweeping, course. sweeping kind of dull question, but... Uh, so, I mean, you, 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 um, you, you come from Estonia, um, one of the things about this game is that you, know, that you have these characters inside yourself. Your character doesn't have full agency. You are being influenced by factors within yourself and outside yourself. Um, a lot of Western RPGs kind of are all about agency, like you are given the power, you are the chosen one and all that stuff. Um, do you think there's anything in, this is where the pretentious bit comes in, do you think there's anything in uh, sort of where you come from and the idea of making a game where you don't have, you're not the hero necessarily, you don't have all the agency in the world? Absolutely, I think. Mm, I don't know, like, uh, to me, uh, the story of the underdog has always been more interesting than the chosen one. Uh, I don't think it, it uh, at least personally, to me, it doesn't have much to do with the Estonian background. But I mean, at, at the same time, look around. Uh, you know, we're at a mainstream yeah, that's, that's video game convention, point, yeah. and, and, uh, and, and a lot of these things are, um, have burly men with, you know, at the height of their powers, you know, conquering stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, yeah, definitely. Um, um, I wouldn't even say underdog, I'd just like a dog on the streets of the world kind of character. If the video game swindle doesn't work out for me, I'm back sniffing fentanyl in Ida Viruma. It's, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, Certainly, yeah, I, that's, I've never thought about it, but, but, but yeah, um, we have uh, the global, cul global culture is an empire culture. It's, uh, um, it, it's, it's, it's got a lot to do with money. No one's, no one's going to you know, come and ask people in Chile to uh, participate in the English-speaking world. You know? um, this, this is a culture made by, uh, by winners on boats who, who sailed to new worlds and then and, uh, and, and committed genocide and, and so on. Um, I, I come from a, from a lineage of serfs, which is sort of like a, a nicer word for slave, uh, <laughs> uh, who were, uh, you know, white slave, I think is a good word for it, who were uh, freed 10 years before uh, the American slaves. Um, and then my uh, experience of, um, of the Western capitalism has been, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union, which, however way you slice it, was a really, really bad time in Eastern Europe in the 90s. Um, so, you know, I have nine grades of education. I never sort of uh, felt, uh, felt like I'm a piece that work, fits really well into the Western um, scene. I, I felt like I was a Soviet person for some reason. Uh, so, naturally, I'm not going to make a game where uh, you step in in uh, ceramic armor and uh, FNAL 16 uh, automatic rifle and, uh, and, and win. <laughs> I'm going to make one where you... Uh, where you're heartbroken and then you're fighting against you know yourself and, and the world which is also <laughs> turns into a big enemy in this game yeah. the challenge of you know doing it i'm much more pretentious than you are oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> i just like the regular guy most <laughs> <laughs> he just plays the, the the cup we call boring car oh yeah yeah you said before that um that you that that, that I mean, this is a quite, quite a political game. And it's not, I don't know if it's a political game. It has politics in it. Um, and you've said before that, that um, something on the lines of a lot of games kind of cover themselves with the... <laughs> politics. This is not a power fantasy, what's going on here. <laughs> they, um, they cover with a fig leaf their politics. Like, they kind of invoke a little bit of the idea of politics, but then they kind of like shy away from really saying much. Um, in this game, uh, you, it, it, like, it addresses lots of things kind of head on. Can you talk about like, why that's important for you as a studio and individuals? Uh, it wasn't really important. It was, it, it, we, I just can't write without it. I just can't write without writing political jokes in there. It's so, politics is so alive with tension uh, and, and, and language and, and interesting things. I mean. Uh, if you start looking at the language of eugenics, for example, 
uh, it's a completely forgotten and, and, uh, and horrible sort of Lovecraftian tome of like really weird morphophysiology and stuff. As a writer, I'm, I'm drawn to interesting words. Um, as a writer, I'm also drawn to, uh, to people interacting with each other and, uh, and then characters. And it was sort of, uh, um, there was no other way but to make it political. The world itself is also a modern world. You know, if you have cars and telephones, someone has manufactured them. Um, someone has to patent, uh, someone put it together, someone has to pay for it, someone isn't going to get a telephone in the next 40 years and so on. Uh, it would just be a world without politics would be hollow world building wise, a modern world. So it was sort of, we knew we needed a new setting to be anyone. If we, if we make a game, we weren't going to get to coast by on, on something that hasn't been done before and then that wasn't going to get people in into making it. Again, you, you, you lose so much of the immersion and realism if you discard this aspect uh, completely. But, I mean, my, I guess my, my suggestion to other video game developers would be to not do it. Because <laughs> you get into shit with politics and that's, that's, you, there's almost no upside uh, to you know, courting a political discussion with your game, which is something I learned early on uh, when we were making the game and when I started reading forums and stuff. <laughs> you know, about things that I said, uh, but the gains are too big there. It's, it's, there's just too much good humor to be done. You can be a cop who's a communist. It's incredibly funny to be that. You go around and say, you know, you know, at one moment you're a communist, and then you're going to tell people like, uh, I'm only pretending. This, I'm actually working on world revolution, bro brother. So <laughs> once I lose my partner, let's come back and you know talk about agitating the workforce. And uh, and I mean, cops have a tendency to be fascists. Generally, they, I mean, they lo look at them. They have like uniform, the baton, and so on. So, if you if you don't look at the fascism of uh, police force, uh, then you're really not doing a hard-boiled detective story. Tashil Hammett, um, the author of the world's first hard-boiled novels, uh, was an ex-Pinkerton agent and a communist. So, you know, he ended up drinking himself to death, much like our character. <laughs> uh, uh, unavoidable, uh, sadly. Uh, I would have liked to like to do it differently. I would have liked to have elves instead of uh, like I would have liked to have slave elves, um, not actual people of of different skin color and so on. I, I, I would have liked to not talk about these things end, uh, head on because they take so much play testing and writing not to fuck it up. Because if you go into that stuff and you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna you're not gonna come out well. <laughs> Um, we're going to open uh, this up for questions uh, now. We've got about uh, ten, oh, seven minutes or so. There's going to be a, a microphone in the middle of the aisle. Um, if you want to ask a question, just come up and queue there. Um, just make your way to the middle and uh, <coughs> first person there, sling us a question. Right, question being slung your way. Um, okay, so you think of... Uh, like Divinity, Pillars of Eternity in your game, and there's a whole um, plethora of choices that you can make, and especially in your game, when I had a look at yesterday, I mean, you can decide where to go, who to talk to, do you want to do something for this lady on this boat when your partner is saying no, and then there's voices in your head, you know, with from your skills and that, all saying all these different things. Um, how did you think about offering a the player so many choices without overwhelming them. Uh, yeah, that's that's an ongoing, ongoing challenge. Because <laughs> uh, 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 now that I hear you saying that, it doesn't seem like much fun. It it seems very. Uh, I thought it was very <laughs> fun. I thought oh. it was great. But then, um, so I've played some other games where you get a million different choices. You know, like you can shape your character in this very unique mm -hmm. way. And for me, I found it way too overwhelming because mm. I didn't know where to start. I mean, I quite like that you had these three base choices and you can create a unique character. But again, like, how do you kind of toe the line between, okay, this is my own playthrough. It's got its own identity. You know, my friend is over there. He's playing that way. He's, his cops just getting pissed up, you mm. know, and chatting up ladies in the hotel in a really bad way. <laughs> You know, how do you make it so identifiable, you know, kind of very unique, but you don't think, hang on, I'm just chucking all these options at this person, they don't know what, where to start. So, so um, the mind-bending thing is that uh, we have like eight writers on the project, 
um, and then the writers have in their head this catalogue of imaginary people, basically you, uh, and, and, and they have uh, different attributes. Some of them are, some of them really hate this, some of them hate that. They're all stressed out, uh, they're all confused, and they're all terrible people, I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, and they have no patience for anything. And you have to listen to all of them while you write, and they're looking over your shoulder and saying, I don't understand anything. Oh God, I hate that. I don't have my option here, and so on. And I believe the, the more you have of these different voices behind you, uh, the more varied they are, uh, the more diverse they are, the better you are a writer. So as an answer, the, this is where most of our time goes into, that body dissection scene. Um, that's what we're accommodating for the stresses and, and the preconceived notions and also dreams and, and kind of humor of the player constantly. And I, I believe our company is doing it very well too. Uh, and people hire editors who make text work that way, but we're absolutely mad about it. We, we like to constantly evolve the player at many moments to ask them, secretly measure them what they think about this and later, you know, come and reward them with little jokes because they say that thing and there and so on. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Hey guys, Hello. I tried the game yesterday and the writing is incredible and that's actually what drew me to the game a lot. Uh, so no pressure. Uh, so I wanted to ask how was it to write not only in a different language but also for a completely different culture? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, it was actually easier than I would have expected. Like, uh, in a way, growing, growing up uh, in Esto Estonia, we were very much influenced by the Western uh, media and like Western worldview. So it wasn't uh, like writing to a completely different culture, actually. It was more familiar, at least to me, than uh, one might expect. But as as language-wise, I don't know, it didn't pose much of a challenge. I, I think but, but we do have like native speaking editors going over, over it. Yeah. Uh, I, f I think in a way Eastern Europe is a, is a part of uh, Western culture, at least definitely English Western culture, that you don't know about yet. Uh, that everyone loved London in the 90s. Suede, oh my God, what a beautiful band. Every, everyone just was just, you, your question was, do you like Damon Albarn? Do you like Brett Anderson? Are you a Liam Gallagher guy? And, and, and sadly, you know, the inv invitation to come here and play our own music never came. <laughs> so it turns out, you know, uh, not, it, it takes a, a lot more than just a band, you know, to finally get to do something here. Uh, I, f I just have so many things to get off my chest and tell you people that it's <laughs> not a big problem. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, um, how do you deal with the kind of conflicting personalities, if there are any, of the different skills? Uh, so, uh, how do we deal with them? having their different way to talk to you and their own charactership, characters? Yeah, like they might want, one might want the character to do one thing, another might want to do the complete opposite. It's the most natural thing ever to yeah. write them. Yeah, and uh, their skills do get into arguments amongst themselves too. You can mediate between them. Yeah. When you happen upon like two or three uh, conflicting views, you know, uh, electrochemistry comes and says, okay, someone just said the word sexual. So uh, this is a good moment for you to say, sexual to them, for, for no reason, because it's funny, do it. Well, you might jump in and say, no, no, that is not a good idea. No, no, don't do it's that. It's never a good Conceptualization idea. comes in and says, it's sort of funny, it's, it's, out, of, it's out of context. They're, they're not going to be thinking, you know, they're going to be thinking you're some kind of strange artist person. You know, logic is going to come in and say, no, they're not going to be thinking that. You're a cop, Harry, why, are you, why are, do you think they're going to be thinking you're an artist? <laughs> it's... Um, Tell them that you're going to choose who, who you listen. And uh, it, it, yeah, it's, um, uh, we, I've brought in now seven writers and shown them the system and everyone just starts hacking away at it. I just need to make less skills basically talking in the game. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, so I, I loved all the writing and all the content. I was also really interested in the art style yeah. where it's that not quite realistic level and there's a kind of a, a painted and, and semi-realistic look. What kind of drove that decision or influenced it? So I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Alexander Rostov, uh, our art director now, so I hope he doesn't uh, uh, 
uh, <laughs> regret anything I'm going to say. Uh, but uh, this character, you have to, have to listen to his name, Alexander Rostov. So, you know, he's a classically um, trained oil painter. Uh, uh, very, like, realist school, Ilya Rep in St. Petersburg kind of stuff. Uh, and then we have, another, uh, uh, we have another artist in our group, too, uh, who we call Kasparov, also an OF ending guy, OV ending guy, so a tremendously talented oil painter. And, and um, these guys, they don't like 3D CGI at all. Uh, they don't like the look of it, they don't like the feel of it, they don't like the glistening of the skin and the subsurface scattering, uh, they don't like the rubbery suits. Uh, they liked it uh, when it was in, uh, in the late 90s in StarCraft uh, cinematics. That was sort of the last time they got really <laughs> excited about it. Uh, or in Johnny Quest even <laughs> before that. <laughs> but like somewhere in the zero zeros, it got really, really old for them. Uh, and while they also like the indie aesthetic of, for example, very neon colored, uh, simplistic, um, uh, cartoonish um, aesthetic, or even uh, pixel aesthetics, which they're bigger fans of than CGI, uh, they sort of think it's a ghetto. Like it's a stylistic ghetto of like, these guys, the small guys, they're gonna do their thing. Uh, of course, they have their cute indie aesthetic. Uh, so it's their ambition to come up with a new aesthetic to do games in, just like our, writer, uh, our writers have an ambition to make a new kind of IP or a world that's a realistic kind of modernist setting where there are, uh, you know, political parties and so on. Uh, it is their ambition to uh, do something that other people are going to emulate uh, because they want to see this kind of brushwork aesthetic in the world. A lot of work has gone into it. Uh, they, did, uh, they did a thing for like seven months where they worked on the characters to make the characters also look like they have brush strokes in them, where they needed to go and paint normals. So normal maps are these um, hmm. uh, shadow maps that make everything look round in CGI. They need to go in with a brush into the information there and work a brush stroke into that so that they, you know, they, their pants kind of look like they're also painted. So yeah, it's, they're trying to do a painted kind of world look which might ring some bells from Dishonored. Uh, That's one of the things it reminded me of, yeah. yeah. And so um, this is not me, this is them. This is, this is our, I'm just quoting my art director. I think he said, they uh, talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. <laughs> so yeah, we have, yeah. <laughs> but this is what happens to you, you know, when you're, when you're cast aside for 20 years into Eastern Europe. Uh, only observing Western culture, <laughs> <laughs> you start saying, you know, these people, you know, the most famous concept artists in Western video games who made Half-Life 2, <laughs> which is the concept artist who made it. Uh, uh, yeah, they sort of want to do it even better, I guess, more integral to the world. Great, thanks. Thank you. And uh, that, I'm afraid, is all we have time for now. Uh, oh, that's a bad thing to finish up. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said it. Uh, uh, not me, uh, Alexander uh, Rostov. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for coming uh, along. Um, uh, Disco Elysium is playable in the Resd area. Uh, if you haven't done so already, I really recommend having a go and seeing exactly what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.